I'm still a piece of fucking human garbage. Except he's not, he's just an easy target. Rocker, rapper, and controversial public figure Ronnie Racky recently joined TikTok, and holy shit. I'm fairly certain that every day since the day he's joined, he's had to publicly defend himself via Stitch or Duet. And I get it. He's got a controversial past, and he can kind of come across like an asshole. As a self-proclaimed person who can come across as an asshole but isn't, I can honestly say he's probably one of the nicest dudes I've ever met in the entertainment industry. So here's my personal story time of how I know this lovable asshole. I met Ronnie in the summer of 2011 on the Vans Warp Tour. This was about two months after he was released from jail, and honestly, at that point, I had no idea who he was. I hadn't been turned on to Escape the Fate until Craig Mavitt was the singer. I didn't know there was an original singer. But, I know the day he arrived, there was a lot of chatter around the tour about him. Remember, I know nothing about this dude, but the rumor mill is fucking churning. So the rumor mill is churning, and I'm hearing all of the worst shit that anybody would ever want to have said about themselves about this dude. I heard he killed a guy, I heard he was a raging drug addict, that he was abusive, that his ego was out of control, and just generally that people didn't understand why he was on the tour, or they didn't want him on the tour. I don't really remember what venue it was, but I remember it was the first date that Sum 41 was playing on the tour that summer. As an elder millennial and an elder emo, ya boy was pumped. I'd never seen them play before, and I was about to see them play for the first time backstage. I made my way over to the amphitheater a little bit early so I could get a good spot backstage, and that's where I saw him for the first time. He wasn't doing anything notable. He was just standing there chilling by himself. Uh, there wasn't anybody immediately around him, but there were a lot of people around the backstage area. The way I was able to tell it was him was just because of generally all of the eyes that were like looking at him from afar. There was a lot of chatter. Like People were talking about this dude. I figure out it's him, and I'm like, oh, cool. And then I just walked to my spot backstage. So Sum 41 goes on, and they're great. They absolutely are killing it, and I sort of get lost in the surrealness of it all because I just never expected to be backstage watching Sum 41. If you had asked 15-year-old me if that was going to be a thing that was happening, it was not going to be a thing that was happening. I had a really good spot backstage, so after a few songs, I was like, all right, I'm going to back out of here and give somebody else a chance to come in and take it in. And wouldn't you know it, as I go to back up, I run into none other than Ronnie Radke. I think I might have stepped on him as I was backing up, actually. So I apologize for bumping into him, and he's just like, oh, no, it's totally fine, and we just eventually sort of strike up a conversation while we're backstage watching Sum 41. He was super polite when he introduced himself. He was like, I'm Ronnie. I was like, oh, hey, I'm Johnny. And we shook hands. I remember him being really soft-spoken. I didn't really know anything about the dude, so I just asked him why he was out on the tour, and he told me that Kevin Lyman invited him out to just sort of shadow and watch the tour for a week. Eventually, after talking about our bands, we exchanged numbers, and he was like, yo, after the summer, we should, like, get together and do a co-write. Flash forward to after Warp Tour 2012, which we were also on. We didn't have any demos to work on them with, so I didn't really hit him up for co-writes between 2011 and 2012, but at the end of 2012, in, like, December, I finally did. In October of 2012, Falling Universe had a headlining date at Pops in St. Louis. And you can bet your ass I was totally that guy and hit him up for guest list. To which he was totally cool about it. He was like, yeah, totally, come by. So I go and see the show, I'm totally blown away. He's an amazing performer live. I had never seen him actually play live. I think he did play on Warp Tour in 2011, but I didn't get to watch him at all. But after heading out of that show, I was wired and I couldn't wait to get to work on our demos. We wrap them up in December. I send three of them to him in January, and he gets right back to me again. To my surprise, he was like, these songs are great. Why don't you come out to LA and let me co-produce them? So I booked my flight immediately. I fly into Burbank. He picks me up from the airport in his really nice Escalade. He shows me the pre-production he's done on our demos. Then he plays me the fashionably late. It wasn't until we were jamming over the demos that I realized like how actively creative his brain is. We jam the new demos until we get to his house, which is apparently where he planned on putting us up for the time we were there. He didn't have to, and we definitely didn't discuss it, but he was happy to do it all the same. Apparently not too long before he came and picked me up from the airport, he had to deal with like a super stalker fan who found out where he lived and was trying to break into his house. But all the same, he was happy to let me stay at his place. We worked over the demos on an acoustic guitar in his living room, and then we called it an early night that night. But the next morning, we get up early and we go, and he takes me to Ryan Ogren's place, who used to be in a band called Runner Runner and Don't Look Down. But this dude is the songwriting partner of Adam Levine and Steve Aoki, so I'm just thrilled that we're even in the same room. The point I'm getting at here is that he didn't have to introduce me to Ryan, and he didn't have to put me up in his house, he didn't have to do a lot of things that he did for me, and he just did it, because he was a nice guy and he wanted to help my band out. It's not exactly like he was getting any clout from working with us, so it was really just out of the kindness of his heart. We'd only gotten to work together for about two days on the demos when he had discovered that Josh Stern had passed away, who was a pillar of the touring community as a tour manager for like Newfound Glory and... Falling in Reverse and Paramore and a bunch of bands. Even though we had to cut that trip short, we were really happy with the way that our demo for Trust had turned out in his hands under his co-production with Ryan. We ended up coming home and reworking the demo to be sort of a hybrid between what he had done in his co-production and what we had in the original. And even still, he was totally cool with that. I'm not exactly sure why he's such a polarizing person for people, but he's never been anything but nice to me, and I've seen him go above and beyond for way more people than just myself. I'm not saying that we're super tight as friends or anything like that, but he's always been nothing but super nice to me. 
In fact, the last time I think I ran into him was in 2018, and he invited us onto his tour bus after his show at Stage AE in Pittsburgh to jam our new record. And not only jammed it, but got into it. Even when he has nothing to gain, he still chooses to be a good dude. So chill.